With the NBA Finals starting soon, I wanted to talk about some players that didn't live up to playoff expectations this year. They could just not be elevating their game, putting up consistent stats, or just staying healthy on the floor. They were disappointing to say the least. We got about 15-ish players to talk about here today, and let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with any of my picks. All right, so first off, we're gonna talk about Tower Hero of the Miami Heat. I kind of feel bad for Tower Hero because he was nursing an injury towards the end of the year, came back for a couple games, and then was thrown into the fire, basically as a number one option for their round one series against the Boston Celtics. Obviously, it was because Jimmy Butler suffered an injury in the playing tournament against the Philadelphia 76ers. They were able to beat the Chicago Bulls in round two of the playing tournament. And we saw a hero play a lot of minutes tonight, 37 minutes a night throughout those five games. He put up 17 points, three and a half rebounds, five and a half assists, basically as the number one option and shot 38% from the field, 34% from three. And I think we're kind of realizing that Tower Hero may not be a number one or number two in this league, which is fine. We kind of expected that from him before, but people are talking about he's only better suited basically to come off the bench. And I feel bad because he's going to be in trade rumors once again this off season. Uh, back in 2019, Tobias Harris signed a massive contract extension to return to Philadelphia. And he has pretty much been disappointing ever since signing that deal. There's been some good seasons in that deal. There's been some bad seasons, but six years fans had some hope that Tobias could step up as a number three option. No longer does he have to be a number two, be a number three behind Embiid and Maxi, and help the Sixers upset the Knicks in round number one. He didn't do that whatsoever. In six games, Tobias Harris put up nine points, seven rebounds, and shot 43% from the field and 33% from three. And in game six, do or die down three games to two, he put up zero points on just two shots. Yeah, he was non-existent whatsoever. It just doesn't seem like he's a winning player. He's not going to be aggressive. He's not going to hustle on the glass. And I think we've seen that year in and year out. Two years ago with Miami, last year with Boston, this year with New York. It's just easy to out hustle and outwork Tobias Harris in the playoffs. This was probably his last ever playoff series with the 76ers. Next up, we're going to talk about Darius Garland of the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Cavs are in a weird position right now. It's looking like they may look to move Garland this offseason. His camp and agency kind of wants him to get out of Cleveland. It seems like him and Donovan Mitchell aren't going to work out together if Mitchell stays in Cleveland. And in the seven game series against Orlando in round number one, Garland was definitely inconsistent. He put up 15 points, five rebounds, and just five and a half assists a night in those seven games. He shot 44% from the field, 40% from three, and 71% from the line. But like I said, it was just really inconsistent for Garland and just seems like a disappointing season overall. Against Boston in round number two, Garland shot 40% from the field in game number one, then 62% in game number two on just eight shots. 40% from the field in game three, 44% from the field in game four, and then 23% from the field in a win or go home game. And it feels like Garland had so much promise in Cleveland in years prior. He had a down year this year, was dealing with some injuries, I think some confidence issues as well, but it was a disappointing playoff series for Garland in which he could have stepped up maybe in the absence of Donovan Mitchell in round two. With the NBA playoffs being in full swing, the best way to play fantasy sports is with underdog fantasy. And in my opinion, it's the easiest way to play fantasy sports and enjoy playoff basketball in 2024. When I'm going to these playoff games and stressing about the New York Knicks or watching these amazing Western Conference games, I'm using Underdog Fantasy throughout it. I love using Underdog Fantasy and playing with friends as well throughout these games, and it really makes it an enjoyable time to watch the playoffs. Underdog's Pick'em game is my favorite way to play fantasy sports right now. You go to the Pick'em tab on the Underdog Fantasy website or app, and you pick either a player will have a higher or lower stat total in that game that they are playing in for a chance to win big. And you can pick between two to five players and a pick them entry and you can win up to 20 times your money if you do get all your picks right. And what I love about Underdog is they're constantly doing promos. The other night they did one where Caitlin Clark scores over half a point and they do these throughout every single sport. Either it's golf, promos in baseball, going to be the WNBA all season long and obviously the NBA as well. And they have a great promotional offer for you guys. If you use my link in the description below or use code SROSS, S-R-O-S, you can get a 50% deposit match up to $250. When you use my code SROSS in the description. You can use that link or obviously code SROSS when sign up. And please remember again to play responsibly. Can't stress that enough. And thank you again to Underdog for sponsoring today's video. All right, I got to put Kawhi Leonard here. I know it's more injury-based, not play-based, but once again, Kawhi Leonard injured for the playoffs. We got him healthy in the bubble back in 2020, but then in 2021 gets hurt in round number two against the Utah Jazz. He misses all of the 2022 playoffs. Last year in 2023, hurt in round one against the Phoenix Suns early in that series. And this year plays in just two games against the Dallas Mavericks. And once again, Kawhi Leonard was injured for the playoffs in a Clippers uniform. He played in game one when they lost by three points. He put up 15 points in 35 minutes. He was clearly nursing an injury. And then in game number two, just plays in 25 minutes when they lost by 11 
seven, put up nine points, and that was it for Kawhi. We never saw him again for the rest of that series. And another year goes by that we didn't even see Kawhi Leonard play in round number two. All right, we got to talk about the Phoenix Suns somewhat, right? I didn't really want to talk about KD or Booker because they put up some really good games at some points, and we kind of had the expectations from their really good regular seasons. I'm going to talk about Bradley Beal here. It's because Phoenix gave up so much for Bradley Beal last offseason when he had a no trade clause and a super max extension from Washington. He's making so much money a year. He did not help them whatsoever on the defensive end of the floor. The Suns got swept. Beal took 10 shots in game number one, put up 15 points. He shot 35% from the field in game number two, 14 points. Points. He had a solid game three, but they lost by 17 and he was a minus 19 on the floor and then just put up nine points on 30% shooting in game number four was really not a factor on both ends was a negative plus minus guy in all four games and for someone that's making what Bradley Beal is making. That's disappointing. Next guy I want to talk about is going to be Franz Wagner of the Orlando Magic. One concern I had for the Orlando Magic in their round one series against the Cavs was going to be who's going to help out Paolo Bancaro in the half court because I had all the faith in the world that Paolo was going to have a good round one series and he did. But who was going to step up and Franz, who's supposed to be that number two, was way too inefficient in this series. It was weird. Franz shot 35% from three as a rookie, 36% from three as a sophomore, but then just 28% from three in year number three. And in the seven games against the Cavs, he put up 19 points, seven rebounds, and four and a half assists. Good numbers on paper, but 40% from the field, 26% from three, and was just kind of all over the place, man. Like 18 points in game number one, 46% from the field. 18 points in game number two, 29% from the field. He had an incredible game number four, but that's what I kind of expected out of Franz Wagner throughout this whole series. A lot of inconsistencies, but this was just his first playoff run. I think he'll be fine. All right, next up, I want to talk about Evan Mobley, but really more his round one series against Orlando. In that series, Evan Mobley put up 12 points, nine rebound shot 47% from the field and 27% from three and going to Mobley I know how good his defense is and he looks like an all defensive and defensive player of the year caliber guy out there at times but then there's times where he's just not aggressive offensively he's not in the right spots his shots aren't falling he played better in round number two against the Celtics especially in that game five game where he put up 33 points seven rebounds on good efficiency but I think we just thought he could have taken a step in these playoffs and just showed lack of aggression but I do think what's a blessing in disguise is we could see how open the floor is for him when he's not out there with Jared Allen clogging the paint and Mobley can kind of go to work on his own in that half court set. I do think you need a four spacer next to him and that's something Cleveland should go out and get this offseason. So yeah, for Mobley, it was more on the offensive side, not the defensive side. We're going back to the Clippers here for our next guy and we're going to talk about Paul George who's supposed to be a free agent this offseason. PG in his round one series against the Dallas Mavericks in six games put up 19 and a half points, seven rebounds and five assists. He shot 41% from the field, 36% from three and 84 percent from the line. Out of those six games, he had two good ones. That's it, basically. For someone that's supposed to make $40 million a year to give you a third of your games to actually give you high quality play, that's very disappointing. It's a shame too, because PG in round one last year against the Phoenix Suns was phenomenal, but definitely took a step back this year. And we'll see if this was his last ever playoff series with the Clippers. Man, oh man, could I not be any more disappointed about Brandon Ingram with the New Orleans Pelicans? He had such a good end to his 2023 season, especially as a playmaker. And I feel like he just had a down year overall throughout the regular season and it carried over into the playoffs he was going to be without Zion Williamson who got hurt against the Lakers in the first leg of the point of the playing tournament and this was the time for Brandon Ingram to step up and he just didn't show up whatsoever Brandon Ingram is the number one option against the Thunder in round one put up 14 points four and a half rebounds he shot 34 percent from the field and 25 percent from three in their sweep. And like Tower Hero, he came back with an injury towards the end of the year, so he was still kind of getting into the flow of things, but nonetheless, it was really disappointing. Just in a close game in game number one, the only close one where they lost by two points, he put up 12 points and shot 29% from the field. What are we doing, Ingram? Then he followed it up with an 18-point performance, 19-point performance, and a 8-point performance on 14% shooting in game number four to get swept. That could have been Ingram's last playoff series with the Pelicans as well. So I talked about how for like Brandon Ingram and Darius Garland, throughout the regular season, they were disappointing and did not meet expectations. But someone that met expectations in the regular season but did not show up in the postseason... D'Angelo Russell. D'Angelo Russell had a great regular season where he put up 18 points, six assists on really good efficiency. He did not shoot them out of games and he felt like he was a winning player. He kind of had a weird playoff series. He started game number one with 13 points on 30% shooting. He shot six for 20. Yeah, that's shooting you out of a game. And then in game number two, he was fine. He shot 50% from the field in a really close loss against the Nuggets. But game number three, man, in 24 minutes, he does not hit a single shot 0 for 7 from the field. Follows it up with a pretty good game number four, puts up 21 points, helps keep the Lakers season hopes alive. But then 
then in game five, winner go home, he shoots 40% from the field, two for 10 from three, just 14 points. And like a lot of these guys could have just played his last playoff series with his current team. And I don't think D'Lo is as disappointing as some of these other guys that we have talked about. I just thought we were going to see a really good, consistent playoff run from D'Lo, especially after the regular season he just had. I have a love-hate relationship with Karis LeVert, man. The memes are legit. Sometimes he acts like he's Michael Jordan out there, and then sometimes it's the NASA Sansa and Kubo. In round one against Orlando, he was not good. He was not the shot creator sixth man that Cleveland needed him to be. He played in just 22 minutes because Bickerstaff could not play him a ton. He averaged seven and a half points, two rebounds, shot 36% from the field, 23% from three, and 66% from the line. And then he obviously had an increased role in round number two with no Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen. He put up 14 points, six rebounds, two and a half assists, shot 49% from the field, 12% from three, and 62% from the line. And if you look back to Levert's last four playoff series, they're not pretty. Like D'Angelo Russell, Rui Hashimura had a really good regular season, and he's still young. I thought he was going to carry that over into the playoffs. It didn't happen on both ends of the floor. Four out of the five games in which the Lakers played the Nuggets, and he scored under 10 points. And the one game he scored more than 10 points, he just shot 40% from the field and missed nine out of his 15 shots. And I don't know, man. I think you can lump in D'Lo and Rui Hashimura as guys that had really good regular seasons and encouraging hopes on what they could be in the playoffs, but they just fell short of those expectations. So there's been rumors lately that the Pelicans want to move on from Brandon and and extend Trey Murphy instead of B.I., but Trey Murphy did not have a good round one series against the Thunder. Murphy played in 42 minutes a night in that sweep. He only scored 11 and a half points, so with guys like McCollum and Ingram not stepping up, neither did Murphy. 11 and a half points, six and a half rebounds, 37% from the field, 33% from three, and shot 30% from the field and 14% from three in game number four when it mattered the most on their home floor. I don't know, you could really give more credit to the OKC Thunder in that defense, and New Orleans was dealing with that their number one guy in Zion Williamson. I just think it was still disappointing for Trey Murphy, who New Orleans is expecting a major jump from if they're going to give him a nice contract extension. What a weird playoff series for KCP. Someone that was going to get us. What a weird couple of playoff series for KCP. The perfect role player to Nikola Jokic in Denver. Someone that was going to get some all defensive team votes. Was pretty horrible against the Lakers in round number one. He put up eight points, two rebounds, and two assists. Shot 37% from the field and 28% from three. And then in round number two against the Timberwolves in their seven game series loss. He put up seven points, three rebounds, and shot 41% from the field and 37% from three. So he was definitely better in round number two than round number one. I just don't think KCP really stepped up at all. In game six, he put up nine points on 33% shooting. And in game seven, he put up five points on 28% shooting. Did not step up in the series' biggest games. I don't really know where to start about Tim Hardaway Jr. I have no idea if he's going to play for the Mavericks in the finals at all. In round number one, he just played in 11 minutes in two games, shot 33% from the field and 33% from three. Played a little bit more in round number two against the Thunder, but he shot 41% from the field and 33% from three. Just played 15 minutes total in their five-game series win against the Timberwolves in the conference finals. The main reason why it's disappointing is because he's making $18 million a year, and he's basically unplayable. So yeah, I hope you guys did enjoy. Drop a thumbs up if you did. There's some other good defenders I could have talked about as well that had disappointing offensive playoff runs like Aaron Neesmith or Isaac Okoro. So you can let me know if I left anybody out of this list in the comments below, or if you disagree with any of these, please also let me know down below. Drop a thumbs up if you guys did enjoy the video, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace.